the categories themselves are what we need to look at and make sure that there's not more opportunity for us to expand in terms of equity or diversity. For this reason, all current serving members on the NRAC that are NRAC appointed, that is the folks not appointed by members of our board of directors, are going to just continue serving their term, even if it expires, they're going to continue serving as long as they uh, choose to until we have the bylaws completed. That way we don't have a lot of hustle, bustle, fuss and muss, uh, while we kind of work through the details and make sure that Ultimately, the positions we're trying to fill are reflective of this group's priorities, goals, and the great diversity that we see in the Houston-Galveston region. We do have some new folks that are going to be joining us from board appointed positions, and I will send those out to you in the meeting minutes. I don't want to miss anyone, and I think I literally got an email from our board coordinator a few minutes ago with another board nomination, uh, but we are really excited about these changes. Any questions about membership? We will talk about the bylaws here in just a minute. Okay, great. All right, the next thing is the environmental committee highlights. Uh, so the first one would be the regional flood management committee by Justin Bauer. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so regional flood management committee met a little earlier. And um, we had some very good discussion of sort of some alternatives uh, to more traditional flood management uh, planning and infrastructure, looking at uh, the impacts of projects like Exploration Green uh, and using um, both natural elements uh, as well as readapting um, spaces and, and, and purposes that, that had um, some good community revitalization benefits uh, and some of the, the good results, both in terms of water quality, community engagement, and, and hydrologic impact that those projects have. had. Um, we also heard from Mac Martin at Texas Forest Service, a, a long-term partner and, and a great moving force in, in urban forestry here in the region, um, gave us a really fantastic presentation. If you haven't heard it, I, I recommend you, um, you, you listen in at some point on um, trees as a stormwater infrastructure, um, sort of best practices, how they're used, their potential in the Houston area as part of our urban forest. Um, so it was really fantastic stuff. Uh, we're working with Mac on a lot of forestry projects right now, uh, so that fit in right well. Uh, we also had an update um, from the GLO on their program, um, Combined River uh, Basins Program, looking at the work they're going to be doing that's going to be supporting and, and working in, in supplement in conjunction with the, the new regional flood uh, planning groups uh, and the very big holistic picture of, of how we're moving ahead as, as a region and as a state. Um, in dealing with, with some of the flood management issues, obviously we have, and that were the focus of a lot of legislation in last year's or the last legislative session. Not as much in this legislative session, though there are a couple of bills that we're watching. Uh, and I would just add that one of the things we are doing as part of RFMC and and in a broader sense for community environment planning is tracking legislation uh, that is active in this session. Uh, we have about 187 bills that we're currently watching for for things that might have some interest to this committee. Um, I'd be happy to provide an updated list. Uh, I know that several of you have been interested in bills like HB 1410 and 2350 that have some uh, potential to expand uh, conservation and natural infrastructure type projects. Um, we're hoping those continue to have some legs. They've stalled a little bit, but we're hoping those continue to move forward. Um, you know, just in terms of other big bills that, that might have some impact, uh, SB 1160, the, the bill to effectively set up the, the mechanism for funding um, the Gulf Coast Protection District that would implement projects like the Ike Dyke and, and other um, coastal recovery projects um, seems to be moving forward. Um, we're, we're hoping that continues to move forward. Uh, it has been amended several times. So we're waiting to see what the, the outcome of the final version is, um, but that legislation is moving forward. And I'd be happy to talk to folks about anything regarding RFMC um, and the bills. I, I believe Kathy and I talked about sending that updated list with the last action and things like that out with the minutes. Um, but I'd again, be happy to talk to anyone about those one-on-one. -on -one. Thank you very much, Justin. Uh, the next is the Solid Waste Management Committee with Aaron Livingston. Hello everyone, good afternoon. Thank you so much for having me. Um, today I am going to be talking about the Regional Solid Waste Grants Program. Um, so I'm not gonna be giving a report on our committee exactly. We are legislatively required to submit this report to the Tex Texas legislature each biennium, uh, but it's also our chance to showcase the great things these funds are able to accomplish. 
So for the last decade, on behalf of the Texas Association of Regional Councils, HGAC has taken the lead on developing this report. In the past, we've always just had a print version of the report, but because of the ongoing situation in the world, um, we have we decided to also do an online version of the report as well this year. So the report currently being submitted to the Texas legislature is for grants funded during fiscal years 2018 and 2019, with the final result for those grants having been um, gathered during the summer of 2020. Next slide. So there were 240 grants that were funded during that biennium with more than $6.1 million going out to the grantees. I'm gonna highlight some of the um, great results that these grants achieved. And just to be clear, the numbers on this slide and on the next four slides are all statewide results. They are not just HJC region results. So next slide. So grantees collected 1.4 million pounds of household hazardous waste with about a million pounds of that being paint. That is enough paint to trace a one inch line around the state of Texas 23 times. Grantees also collected 1.25 million pounds of electronics um, for recycling with these grant funds. Next slide. There were 25 local enforcement grants that were funded. The grantees investigated over 5,000 illegal dumping sites. They identified more than 1,600 violators and removed more than 21 million pounds of illegally dumped waste. Through billboards, radio spots, and other mass media activities, grantees reached out to Texans almost 40,000 times. Next slide. $430,000 was spent to recycle over 213,000 scrap tires and over 14 million pounds of trash and recyclables were collected at cleanup events across the state. Next. This is the final slide about the results. Grantees diverted 17 million pounds of recyclables and almost 98,000 students attend a school district that received grant funding for a recycling grant. Next. So in addition to the results that are in the report, the legislative report also highlights challenges and successes of the grants program through the use of stories. So the topics that were included in this year's report include illegal dumping enforcement, the use of partnerships to stretch dollars, pharmaceutical collection, electronics recycling, and household hazardous waste collection. And these challenges and success stories are, again, for the whole state, but they would also be true if we were just talking about this uh, HJC region. Next. So the final thing that this report includes is a two-page spread to highlight each COG region. COGS get to highlight the project or projects they think tells the best story. Next. So it also includes a list of the grantees for that biennium and the types of projects that were funded. During fiscal years 2018 and 2019, um, grant funds benefited all counties within the HJC region. I'd like to highlight just a few of the HJC region results for you now. Um, so first, our local enforcement grantees investigated over 3,500 illegal dumping sites and found the responsible party in about 40% of those cases. Second, our recycling grantees collected more than 5.4 million pounds of recyclables. And third, our household hazardous waste grantees collected about 350,000 pounds of household hazardous waste. Next. So for this report, HJC chose to highlight the Pearland Recycling and Household Hazardous Waste Facility. This facility serves the residents of the city of Pearland, but they've also found a way to serve those in the surrounding communities that don't have anywhere to take HHW and electronics for recycling. Next. So thank you so much for your time. If you do have any questions right now, I'd be happy to answer those for you. And if you want to be able to see the full report, both the, um, the print version and the online version, you can find links to those on the TARC website. And I think Andrea just shared them for you in the chat. So thank you. Thank you so much, Erin. And I, I'm sorry, I, I was looking at the chat that uh, Andrea just shared. All right, so the next thing is the environmental program highlights, uh, the coordinated monitoring schedule uh, with uh, Todd running. Good afternoon, everybody. I just wanted to give you a little uh, update on Clean Rivers program things. Um, so Kathy, if you go to the next slide. 
So on water quality monitoring, uh, we just had our um, coordinated monitoring meeting the last week of March and really want to give thanks uh, to all of our uh, partner agencies. I um, you know, we're looking at monitoring at about 419 sites uh, throughout the, the bays and estuaries and the rivers and, and the streams that we're responsible for under the Clean Rivers Program. And you can see all the dots here. I just wanted to give you a brief rundown um, of the numbers here. Um, San Jacinto River Authority um, has 19 sites up on Lake Conroe and in the Woodlands area. Uh, Houston Health Department has 133 uh, sites uh, throughout the city of Houston. Um, the H city of Houston drinking water operations has 22 locations uh, around the Lake Houston watershed, looking at our drinking water supplies. Harris County Pollution Control, they've got 33 uh, sites that are looking in some of our side bays and Clear Lake areas. And uh, then our uh, Texas uh, Re um, Institute at Sam Houston uh, State University, they're way up there in the upper portions of the East Fork and in that area, they've got 10 sites up there. Uh, the Environmental Institute of Houston, um, 74 locations uh, found kind of throughout the southern area of our uh, jurisdiction. Uh, HGAC staff uh, do 20 sites, and those are up in the upper portions of the watersheds where we don't have any one doing monitoring, so we're able to get those upper watersheds. And then the TCEQ, um, the Region 12 office, you can see all the dots there out in the uh, Galveston Bay and Trinity Bay in that area. And they've got a total of 108 sites that they do um, in our area. So it's a lot of monitoring that's going on um, at least quarterly and you know all approved under quality assurance project plans. So we can be really happy with the coverage that we've got. Um, and But big thanks to all of our partner agencies for the monitoring that they're doing. Next slide, Kathy. And I just wanted to focus a little bit. I talked uh, last time I was uh, with you all in February, uh, we were talking about the targeted monitoring that was gonna be starting up and uh, we've been really going at it um, hard. And so if you take a look at the map, those are all the areas. We've got 10 um, assessment units and water bodies that have the highest uh, bacteria readings in our area. And the idea is to go out and find illicit sources, illicit connections, um, during dry weather flows and trying to ferret those out and work with the jurisdictions that are responsible in those areas to figure out what those sources are and to eliminate those. And so that arrow, uh, the red arrow up in the, the top portion of the, the map, at, that's White Oak Creek um, up in Conroe, the HGAC um, team is, is doing that one. And all the rest with the orange arrows, the Environmental Institute of Houston, has been working on. And so all of the windshield surveys have been completed. Um, all of the first rounds of monitoring for each one of those have complete have been completed. And we've held meetings uh, with the city of League City and the city of Houston to talk about some of the issues we found. We've got more meetings that'll be coming up. And then we'll be meeting uh, with HJC staff in the city of Conroe to go over what we found there. Uh, but I will tell you, uh, we have found some dramatic numbers. Um, the White Oak Creek, uh, for example, um, they took a total of 29 samples. Um, and this is upstream and downstream of maybe what are tributaries coming into White Oak Creek. Um, of those 29 samples, only three samples met the water quality standards for bacteria. All the rest were over. Um, and those ranged from 173 and just or as a reminder, 126 colony forming units um, per 100 milliliters of water is the standard. Uh, these range from 173 to 17,300. So we're talking about very large amounts of bacteria. And if anybody's been to White Oak Creek uh, up there in Conroe, it's one of those places you'd look at. It's th the water is crystal clear. It's nice sandy bottom. It's the perfect place to have a picnic to get in the water and splash around. It's very inviting, uh, but it's teeming with bacteria. And so we'll be working with the city of Conroe to try to ferret out where those sources are coming from, as well as the, the other places in our region that are like that. So this is, I think, monitoring that's going to move the ball um, in getting rid of a lot of these illicit connections. So we're really excited about that. But we'll have all of this um, wrapped up 
uh, in August uh, for our Clean Rivers program. And then just some important upcoming dates. Um, you can see we had our coordinated monitoring meeting. Our draft base summary report is will be due the May 21st. We'll have a Clean Rivers Program Basis Steering Committee meeting to go over that um, report, as well as our new upcoming contract with TCEQ. That's a two-year contract. And then our final basis summary report will be on uh, June 15th. So we've got a lot uh, going on, and Brian's going to update you on even more stuff going on with Clean Rivers. So um, it's an exciting time. We're, we're very busy and always look forward to having you all participate with us as much as you can. So that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Todd. Um, as Todd said, Brian Sims is going to talk about the monitoring efficiency study and then the draft basin summary report. Uh, take it away, Brian. Thank you very much. Uh, like I said, my, my presentation, uh, the first one is talking about the monitoring efficiencies analysis, and this ties in directly with what Todd was just presenting on. Uh, next slide, uh, Kathy. Um, you know, as Todd was discussing on our various um, monitoring stations that we have throughout the region and how that is developed through our coordinated monitoring meeting. During the last two uh, cycles of the coordinated monitoring meeting, we've been discussing with our various partners and uh, contractors different ways that we can uh, look at those monitoring and reporting components of our program and identify ways to increase efficiencies and use any of those cost savings that we find to do more special projects such as the targeted monitoring project that Todd was also talking about. Uh, next slide. Uh, so the first thing that we're wanting to do is, um, you know, talk to, to each partner, find out what their needs are, what they're monitoring, why they're monitoring, what areas that they're looking in, if there's any specific data needs that they're looking for. So we're looking at not only the monitoring stations, but the stream segments, the assessment units within those segments uh, to identify any areas where there's any overlap or duplication of effort where there may be two partners monitoring the same area. Uh, we did identify a few of those. Um, in some cases, it was different partners looking for different parameters. You know, for example, uh, Texas Commission on Environmental Quality may be collecting metals and sediment, whereas City of Houston may be collecting, you know, bacteria and nutrients, things of that nature. And we also were looking at uh, equipment needs, any training opportunities that we may need to make available, and our data management needs. Uh, next slide. So, like I said, we the, the primary thing that we initially started out looking for was that overlap in the monitoring data. Because um, all of this data that is collected is being submitted to TCEQ to use in their um, assessment uh, for the um, impaired water bodies within the state. So every every uh, two years they do do an assessment, and this this data uh, contributes to that. Uh, so um, that was our primary thing: is to make sure that TCEQ was receiving the the data that they were needing, and that there was no unnecessary monitoring going on, or to see if we can identify some areas where we may need to adjust monitoring priorities to get additional data that they may need. Uh, one of the things that we did identify through this study was that several of the partners had requested some additional or expanded training opportunities. Uh, several of the partners have had um, some staff turnover, both on the field side and the laboratory side. Um, so we, we found a good opportunity there to offer to try to develop some of those training programs, uh, which will in the long run uh, improve efficiency by you know, making sure everybody is on the same page and using the same techniques and procedures and the most updated methodologies. Um, with that, we're also looking at the additional monitoring equipment. You know, all of, all of our monitors have uh, multi-sond uh, data sonds to go out and collect conductivity and pH um, things of that nature, but some of those are, you know, reaching the end of their lifespan and, you know, they, that means they take longer to calibrate or they may need to be sent off for repairs, which delays monitoring activities. So we're looking at, you know, what type of equipment, you know, also equipment on the laboratory side to update methodologies there that may improve efficiencies either through sample throughput or lower detection limits, things of that nature. 
And the, the primary thing that we identified though uh, was a need to improve data submission and review procedures. Um, you know, we have, as Todd mentioned, seven different partners and we have seven partners that are submitting data in seven different methods. So we're looking at trying to consolidate and come up with a standardized methodology so that the data that we, the, the partners are submitting and we are receiving is in a consistent format, reducing the overhead on the data processing time that it, that it takes uh, so we can get this data reviewed and quality assured and submitted to TCQ for their assessments in a more uh, timely, timely manner. Next slide, please. Um, and that kind of is just a general overview of the project that we're doing right now. Uh, we will be uh, presenting the report for this study at the Clean Rivers uh, Basin Steering Committee meeting on, on June the 2nd uh, from two to four. Everyone is uh, welcome to, to attend. Uh, and if you'd like more information on the steering committee, uh, Todd Running or Gene, Gene Wright can, can help you, provide you more information and, uh, you know, help you sign up for that, that meeting. Thank you. And I'm back. <laughs> um, the, the next project I want to talk about is our uh, basin summary report. Um, next slide. Um, so each year as part of the uh, Clean Rivers program, we prepare a report on water quality within the basin. Uh, most years, it's our traditional basin highlights report. Um, this is done annually, includes a, st a brief status of the regional water quality, any issues that there may be, and an overview of the activities that we've done in the previous year. Every five years, though, we are required to do a basin summary report, which is a, a very thorough and comprehensive review and analysis of the region's water quality. Uh, next slide. Uh, with this, the Basin Summary Report is required by the Texas Water Code, Chapter 26. Uh, this report um, is submitted annually to the Texas Commission on Environmental Quality, the Texas State Soil and Water Conservation Board, Texas Parks and Wildlife, the Governor, Lieutenant Governor, and Speaker of the Texas House of Representatives. Uh, so in this, this report, uh, again, like I said, it was re required by the Water Code, and they have some very specific items that have to be included. Uh, such as an identification of any water bodies within the region that are impaired or potentially impaired, uh, a discussion of the cause and possible sources of those impairments, and re any recommended actions to address those concerns. Uh, we also discussed the public benefits of the water quality monitoring and assessment program, including uh, any efforts to increase the public input into the, into the process. Uh, next slide. So, unfortunately, I do not have a live version of the report to do, uh, to show you today. Uh, we're working on an interactive story map as we do each year. Um, but right now, we're still waiting on some of the data to be incorporated into that. So we don't have this live yet to show you. But it's going to be break it, broken down into several main sections. Um, the executive summary, an int introduction. Uh, public involvement and outreach discussing some of the various programs that we do throughout the basin, including our uh, watershed based plans like the uh, watershed protection plans and the total maximum daily loads, the bacteria implementation group, things of that nature. Uh, there's a water quality review where we talk about um, you know, just a general overview of the water quality within the basin. And then we go down into individual summaries of 57 different watersheds within the basin. Um, and those are very highly detailed uh, uh, summaries of, of each watershed. And then finally, we'll uh, finish up with some recommendations and conclusions. Uh, next slide. So for, for each of those watershed summaries, we drill down uh, pretty deep. We look at uh, you know, a general description of the watershed, uh, the different segments, the classified and unclassified segments within that watershed, uh, the monitoring stations that are in that watershed, including the professionally monitored stations that Todd mentioned, plus also our Texas Stream Team monitoring. Uh, we look at land cover data and how that's changed over time 
any water quality issues within within the uh, segment, uh, any impairments for bacteria or nutrients, uh, chlorophyll, dioxins, PCBs, things of that nature. We look at potential sources of those all with interactive maps. So you can look at the maps, turn on different layers. You can look at the wastewater treatment uh, plant outfalls, the on-site sewage facilities, things of that nature. Uh, there's a trend analysis where we look at the water quality data covering a 20-year period for, for multiple parameters, um, particularly focused on any that are showing um, areas where water quality is deteriorating or where it's improving. So we can, we can show how the change over time over the past two decades and how you know, our monitoring efforts are able to track that and how any plans and projects such as watershed protection plans or TMDLs may have impacted those over time with any best management practices that have been implemented. Uh, we look at any of the special studies that are going on within that watershed and uh, specific recommendations for that watershed based upon the unique characteristics of that watershed. Uh, next slide. So uh, as, as Todd mentioned, the, the, the draft will be uh, ready in, in late May, uh, but we will be presenting the draft report to the Basin Steering Committee on um, June 2nd from two to four. Again, uh, anyone is welcome to attend, attend that meeting and provide any input that you have on, on that report. We would encourage anyone who, who has an interest in, in the project um, to, uh, please participate in uh, Todd and Jean uh, could help you with that as well and their contact information is provided. Thank you. Well, good afternoon. This is Justin Bauer. I'm going to take Brian's cue and, and uh, move on into mine. Uh, real quick updates on Cypress and, and Clear Creek watersheds. Uh, Cypress Creek watershed, we are near the end of that process. We have submitted the watershed protection plan after a fantastic amount of work on behalf of our stakeholders. Um, that is with TCEQ. It'll be going to EPA soon, hopefully. Uh, in the meantime, we're not wasting a step. We are moving forward with several implementation projects under that watershed protection plan. Uh, a lot of them right now revolve around uh, potential conservation and forestry projects, uh, working closely with Texas Forest Service and some of our other partners in that area. Uh, we're also working on the, a much broader level with EPA uh, and GLO and, and others um, and TCEQ and the core. Um, sorry, I said GLO, I, I meant the core. Um, on a modeling project, um, we're, they're using a, a new WMOS modeling package to sort of look at a, a very combined hydrology and water quality scenario sort of situation with Cypress. Um, you know, obviously a, a watershed of great concern in terms of repetitive flooding, but obviously also for us and, and other folks, a, a watershed of concern in terms of water quality, uh, both as a, a source water watershed and, and also as a recreational watershed. Uh, so we'll, we'll continue to work through that process with them. We're very excited to see the results. Uh, if anyone in or ha who has some jurisdiction or interest in the Cypress Creek watershed has ideas or potential events or opportunities, um, we are always looking for, for partnership opportunities, either for ourselves or some of our local partners. So I, I really recommend that you contact us. Um, and I'd be happy to talk to anybody about that project in greater depth. Uh, on the Clear Creek side, uh, we are just starting our process with Clear Creek, um, developing the watershed protection plan. We haven't yet kicked off the public engagement piece of that. We'll be meeting one-on-one -on -one with a lot of our uh, member governments in the area and other key partners. Uh, we're very excited to be working down in that part of the world. Uh, we know there's a lot of great work that's, that's already gone down, on down there. Um, we're hoping to build off that and uh, bring in some new tools. Um, but we will be continuing to work on that. Uh, again, the same sort of message. If anyone has active projects or knows of good work in the area that's ongoing or has special areas you think need attention, please let us know. Um, you know, the more we can build in on the front end, the better we can shape that project to, to meet the needs of the local stakeholders. And that's all I have for those two. Next up, we have Rachel Windham. 
All right, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, so I'll just be talking a little bit about Spring Creek, uh, which just to orient you, Spring Creek is the water body that uh, forms a large part of the border between Montgomery and Harris counties. Uh, and it's a little bit of a tale of two different land cover types. So on the eastern side of the watershed, we have more developed area, uh, including the Woodlands Township, uh, the Tomball area in spring, as well as the I-45 corridor. Uh, but the farther west you move in the watershed, the land cover becomes more natural. There's more forested area, wetlands, and grassland. Uh, so the TCEQ, Texas Commission on Environmental Quality, has identified water quality in Spring Creek and many of its tributaries as impaired uh, due to high levels of fecal indicator bacteria. And some of the other concerns uh, in and around Spring Creek include low uh, dissolved oxygen levels and high levels of nutrients. So the Spring Creek Watershed Partnership has been meeting uh, on a regular basis since July of 2020 uh, to try and come up with some community-led voluntary strategies for water quality improvement. So last year, our focus as a partnership was more on describing the problem. Uh, so actually using some uh, models to uh, understand more of the pollution sources in the watershed and some of the dynamics of those pollution sources. And now, uh, this year, we're more focused on actually developing implementation strategies um, and turning that into a watershed protection plan. So the first draft of that plan will actually be available for review uh, at our next partnership meeting. So. Our next partnership meeting will be on June the 3rd uh, from 2 to 4 p.m. That's a Thursday. And I believe uh, Andrea will help us out putting the link in the chat if you're interested in registering to join us. Uh, we'd love to have you there. It's a public meeting. Uh, so we'd really love to get some feedback from you. Uh, and if you need more information on the project, um, you can go ahead and check out our project website at springcreekpartnership.com. Uh, or you can get in touch with me directly. So my email address is rachel.windham uh, at h-gac.com. And I'd love to hear from you. So that's that's it for Spring Creek. All right, Justin, you wanna take the urban foresty update? Absolutely. Uh, and I apologize to everyone. I'm having some camera issues today. It wouldn't be a meeting without at least one technical glitch. Um, but I'll be seeing a lot of you very soon. So um, we have been uh, working with a lot of our local partners on a variety of community forestry initiatives. Uh, several years ago, we had worked um, with many of you in the room and, and others on a urban uh, Houston area urban forest project, looking for uh, sort of a regional vision for urban forestry um, and ways to coordinate a lot of the fantastic work that's being done on the local level um, by folks like Texas Forest Service, City of Houston and others. Uh, I'm excited to say we're moving forward with a lot of projects. Um, there's just a lot of great work that's happening. Uh, urban forests are are kind of the 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 real moving uh, real uh, moving concern right now. Um, we have been coordinating with the Tree Strategy Implementation Group run out of Houston Wilderness, uh, looking at that ambitious 4.6 million tree goal. Uh, the city of Houston, uh, as part of Resilient Houston, and, and other planning. Um, and there's just a, a tremendous amount of, of opportunity there. Um, we are doing our very best to engage that on the watershed protection plan side of things, as well as some of our other projects. Um, we have just started working with Texas Forest Service and, and, and City of Houston and, and other local partners on uh, the potential to do a corporate partnership program. Um, we've identified some priority planning sites. We're currently looking at stuff on uh, Cypress Creek, but we'd love to expand this as we have capacity. Uh, and looking at the opportunities to, to bring in some corporate sponsorship um, in exchange for um, some very quantifiable benefits that we can provide to them in terms of you know, what their investment is doing and, and what they can, they can tout uh, with their investment. Uh, we're also focusing on, on forests, our, our, you know, our, wonderful, our region's wonderful urban and, and external forests as part of the Regional Conservation Framework Project that uh, we've been working on for a while and are going to be working on for a while longer. Um, so look forward to, to hearing more on that. Uh, for those of you who haven't been involved in the Texas Forest and Drinking Water Partnership, um, I highly recommend that you, that you get involved. Um, this is a group of quite a few um, decision makers, uh, both on the forestry side, the municipal side, water management side, um, across the state, but, but focused um, especially here in the Houston area, um, looking at you know, where there's, there's overlap, there's shared opportunity for source water projects that, that benefit forestry, how forests can can benefit as both the stormwater and water quality 
uh, thing. And we've been working to identify project opportunities. Uh, so now is a great time. If you haven't been involved in this project, I'd be happy to talk to folks offline about that. To get involved, um, we've, uh, we're always on the lookout for uh, potential funding sources and matching those to potential projects. Uh, we've also been working just kind of a regional level. I, I wanted to, to tout the, the great work of, of City of Houston here. Um, we were involved in a Force in Cities uh, conference and, and seminar put on by the New York, uh, the New York um, City as a natural resources um, group. Uh, and uh, that has been an ongoing process and um, we've had a couple articles published already and we're continuing to work on an upcoming project that we'll, we'll be pushing out to you. Uh, I just wanted to say that Houston is being recognized on, on the national level, the Houston area um, for its work uh, in urban forests. Um, and uh, there's a lot of things that we can learn from other places, but I think we also have some great projects and great work that's being done by you and your organizations uh, that we've been very proud to, to put forward there um, and has generated a lot of interest among our, our national peers. Uh, so that's all I had. Uh, again, we're always looking for opportunities and partnerships, um, and uh, we'd love to talk to you all more about that in depth. Sounds good, Justin. Uh, Brian, you want to talk about the Water Quality Management Plan overview? Yes. Um, uh, this presentation, we're going to discuss our annual update to our Regional Water Quality Management Plan. Uh, Next slide. Um, annually through the uh, 604B, um, uh, 604B of the Clean Water Act, uh, we, we have a grant through Texas Commission on Environmental Quality to conduct uh, water quality management planning for the 13 county uh, region. Um, next slide. And through this project, uh, this project uh, describes a series of data collection, special studies and coordinate coordination activities that we use to acquire water quality uh, and wastewater infrastructure data throughout the region. Uh, this includes things such as sanitary sewer overflows, uh, discharge monitoring report data, on-site sewage facility data, service area boundaries for wastewater treatment facilities, things of that nature. And we analyze this data um, particularly those related to non-point sources of pollution and try to determine you know, how they may be impacting the region. We also make this data available to our other water quality programs, such as the Bacteria Implementation Group, Clean Rivers Program, and the Total Maximum Daily Load and Watershed Protection Plans. All of those use this data that is collected under this uh, management plan. And once this management plan is uh, reviewed by NRAC and goes out for public comment, um, it gets approved by HGAC's board of directors, certified by TCQ, and approved by EPA, and is actually incorporated into the state's water quality management plan. Uh, next slide. So th there's several uh, project objectives that we're looking at here. Uh, some of them are pretty general, like the project administration and the quality assurance that we do to verify the quality of the data that is acquired from you know, sources of known quality and that is reviewed to make sure that it meets the data quality objectives that we have for the project. Uh, the primary tasks that we do under this project are, include uh, the collection of the wastewater data, the wastewater data update and coordination. Uh, through this, we acquire um, wastewater discharge data for, for the region. That includes uh, um, developing an outfall layer for of all the wastewater outfalls within the region. Uh, there's 1,243 uh, permitted wastewater outfalls within the, within the region. And of those, um, 1,001 of those submit discharge monitoring report data. So some of those outfalls aren't, are intermittent or variable discharge data. So there's not constantly um, discharge data from that, but we're looking at 1,000, outfalls submitting wastewater data and we and we look at the results of that that data to, to see what the compliance rates are for the different facilities not only overall but based upon different relative size of the treatment plants we can look at the five million gallon per day plants and the, the less than 0.1 million day uh, million gallons per day plant and every range in between just to see if we can identify any patterns uh, 
We also support uh, watershed uh, planning activities through through this. So many of the watershed protection plans and TMDLs have their own grants associated with them that but any of those that are fall outside of those specific grants, we help to do some of the watershed planning and coordination with that. That includes the things such as the um, urban forestry that Justin was just speaking about. Uh, through this project, we also coordinate our on-site sewage facility activities. That, in, that includes a, a database of all the permitted systems within the region. Uh, we, we collect data from all the authorized agents that permit the systems in each county, uh, uh, consolidate that data and develop a uh, interactive mapping system so you can go in and look at those uh, data points, the, the number of systems, the concentration of those, the number per square mile, the distance between those systems and the nearest water body, things of that nature. Uh, we also do coordination activities for on-site sewage system uh, repair and re repair and uh, replacement project. And finally, we prepare the water quality management update, uh, which is the annual report that is submitted each year. Uh, next slide. Um, so like I said, you know, the, 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 prim the primary thing that we do here is the wastewater data update where we go through and we look at all of those outfalls, the service area boundaries, we develop those maps and those databases to those and those are actually data deliverables that are submitted to TCQ under the contract. Uh, we, we look at the discharge monitoring report data with a specific focus on uh, the bacteria discharges since that is the, the leading source of impairments within the region. And the sanitary sewer overflow data, we, we, we look at that not only in location, frequencies, amounts, but also the causes that are reported for those to see if we can identify any patterns. Uh, next slide. Um, again, the, the on-site sewage facility program, this is one of our, our major projects under, under this, and this is very useful for numerous projects. This, this data feeds into almost every other project that we do regarding uh, watershed-based planning, uh, on-site sewage facilities. <laughs> Uh, do a great job in, in treating wastewater when they're properly sited and functioning, but once they fail, they tend to fail catastrophically. So we want to keep an eye on these and, and look at those systems so we know where they're at, the age of the systems, how long they've been in the ground, you know, try to identify if they may be any problems, and if so, how what we can do to remediate that. And this this is the project that allows us to collect that data and generate this information and make it available to all of our other programs. Uh, next slide. And finally, uh, we prepare the annual report that summarizes all activities and findings um, that are gained through this project. Uh, we present the draft update to NRAC. This is typically at the August meeting. Uh, it's also provided to uh, the general public for review and comments in accordance with the Texas Water Code. Uh, any comments that we receive will be incorporated into the report. Uh, any changes that are necessarily will be made and then it'll go to the board of directors and we'll provide documentation that the board has accepted the completed report to TCEQ. Uh, next slide. So, uh, just to give you the uh, time frame of uh, what's coming up with the uh, the final report, uh, we should have the draft or all the project data deliverables, such as the wastewater outfall layers, the DMR analysis, the OSSF database, those are all due July 1st. Uh, on that same date, we will be sending out the report electronically to the NRAC members, uh, so you can review and provide comments on those reports. Uh, those comments that we receive are very, very helpful for us in not only, you know, reviewing and updating this report, but planning for next year's activities as well. Uh, this submission to NRAC also opens a 30-day public comment period in accordance with the Texas Water Code. So um, the draft report will be due on uh, July 30th to TCEQ for their review. Um, then we will we will begin re revising the comments, revising the reports based upon any comments we receive from TCQ, NRAC, or the general public. Uh, the, re 
the report, the final report, along with a summary of the data, uh, will be provided in a presentation to NRAC on August the 5th, uh, at which point NRAC will make a recommendation to submit the report to the Board of Directors for acceptance. Uh, that Board of Directors meeting will be on August 17th. The Board will vote on the report. If they choose to accept that report, it will be submitted to TCQ as the final report, at which time they will certify it, get an EPA approval and incorporate it into their, into the state's water quality management plan. Next slide. And with that, uh, if you have any questions or comments, uh, this is my contact information. Feel free to call me or, or email me. And like I said, I'll be coming to you in August with a detailed presentation on some of the findings that, that we've had looking at some of the numbers that go into the report. Thank you. All right. Well, first, I'd like to just thank everyone that worked on the uh, environmental programs. It's a lot of hard work and a lot of that data goes into other stuff that we're all working on. And I uh, just wanted to thank everyone for that. Uh, next thing is the subcommittees, uh, Parks and Natural Area Subcommittees. Uh, Glenn, you wanna take it away? I do believe I will. Um, the uh, day immediately after the last meeting of this August body, uh, was the day that the uh, Joint uh, Parks and Natural Areas and WISE, the Water Innovation Strategies of Excellence Awards, uh, were uh, uh, celebrated. Uh, a total of 109 people uh, logged in on Zoom uh, to participate in that. And, um, and since I'm interested in PNA, uh, there were 20 of the uh, uh, award winners were P were to uh, for, for those projects. Uh, the next month, uh, the roundtable got together on Zoom uh, on March the 8th. Uh, there were 22 people logged in on that meeting, uh, covering um, a lot of entities and uh, uh, of which, unfortunately, only four were outside of Harris County. Uh, but it was a good meeting nonetheless. Uh, there was a lot of sharing, particularly at the end on the, uh, the round table, the, the true round table, uh, where everybody was sharing various and sundry information. Uh, but um, Kathy Jansen uh, presented on uh, Trash uh, Free Texas and Adopt a Spot opportunities that were out there for anybody that was interested. Uh, Kendall Giedros, uh made a presentation on the what was then the upcoming virtual trash bash. Then um, the next um, we oh and by the way of course because COVID is still with us uh, in uh, uh, this month we will not be uh, hosting or organizing a field trip to a previous winter. Uh, we'll just keep our fingers crossed and hope that by November we will be in the field. Uh, and um, moving forward, the next uh, PNA roundtable will be on Monday, July the 12th. And fingers crossed, we might be meeting face-to-face, -face, or we might be back on Zoom. Stay tuned for further information. In terms of the annual cycle, the process of the uh, p and Awards now for 2021, uh, what's ahead of us now is the HJC staff is uh, uh, working hard, reviewing the um, uh, application, uh, the deadlines and the outreach uh, efforts, and they will bring those recommendations to that July meeting in whatever form it may occur in uh, for thumbs up, thumbs down, let's proceed. So then after that, we will begin soliciting judges in July uh, and open the awards application period in September. Uh, with the timing after that, 
probably similar to uh, to last year's. So that's uh, really about all we've got right now. Thank you so much, Glenn. Uh, Kathy, you want to tell us about the Water Innovation Strategies of Excellence? I am happy to do so. There won't be a ton of updates on the WISE Awards at this juncture, as Glenn referenced. We joined in partnership with the Parks and Natural Areas Awards for a ceremony on February 6th of this year. And it was really great and successful. We were really excited about it, but we have not moved forward with putting out the call for WISE Awards applicants in 2021 for a couple of reasons and thus haven't met with the subcommittee either. Uh, on HJC side, we're looking at the awards. We want to see what we can do on our end to increase uh, the promotional aspects of it and make sure that we're really capitalizing with the right audience on it. Once we've got some of our ducks in a row on this end, we're going to re-engage with the subcommittee likely this fall to talk about a rollout. I don't know if this is going to result in us uh, taking a pause for 2021 and having our third round of WISE Awards in 2022. Time will tell, but we are excited about this still and committed to seeing the WISE Awards through. We're just retooling a bit to make sure that we're really intentional in what we're doing and we're reaching the widest variety of audience members and applicants possible. If you don't mind, Richard, I'm just going to keep going with the NRAC bylaws subcommittee update. We had the very first meeting of the bylaws subcommittee last Tuesday, the 27th. We had reasonable attendance, but there is still room for additional folks on the NRAC committee if they are interested in being a part of this conversation. We're really starting to build some momentum now. As I alluded to earlier during the membership update, there are a couple of factors motivating this discussion. One, there's been a really significant shift in the regional demographics here in the Houston Galveston region since the inception of NRAC. And I, to be frank, I'm not even sure how old NRAC is. 20 years, 25 years, there's been a lot of change. And that again, that last update on the bylaws was in 2011. So we think there's a real opportunity for us to take a look at the bylaws, specifically the NRAC appointed membership positions, and make sure that those are reflective of the right communities, of the right areas of interest, and any number of other factors. There are a lot of environmental justice issues. We want to build on the momentum from this past summer and ensure that we are doing our part and our due diligence to be as inclusive as possible because Ultimately, the environment, environmental issues, it impacts all of us, some of us uh, disproportionately so. And so we want to make sure that we're honoring that. Uh, the second factor motivating this discussion, uh, we really see there are a lot of new opportunities to build capacity and access with some of these new networks and again, the changing demographic, the new audiences in the region. We really want to tap into that. And finally, HJC has received some additional grant monies from the Houston Endowment to start implementing uh, the conservation work that was outlined in the regional conservation framework. You may remember from past presentations by Justin, by myself, by Jeff Table, uh, this is work that we entered into with uh, Houston Wilderness, January, uh, Deborah January Beavers, and, and some other folks at the Houston Endowment, there's a real opportunity for us to harness the force we have here with NRAC and see how we might better connect the committee with our conservation work and, and how the two might ultimately coalesce. So we're really exploring that as we move forward. You might be asking yourself, what do we see as, as sort of next steps or the path forward for engaging in both the equity, diversity, and conservation pieces? Well, there's really four parts that we discussed, and we're going to really dig into it at our June 8th meeting. And if you're interested in attending that and want to join the subcommittee, please let me know. But uh, item one is we're going to adopt some language in our bylaws that really specify what our aims are, helping us to focus at the point of nomination so that when we seek a nominee, these are factors we're looking at. Uh, how, how representative are they of alternative voices or diversity in our region? Uh, do they have conservation experience? Will they help us tap 
into new audiences and new channels, we want to make certain that we're being cognizant of that because again, we want everyone to have a seat at the table. We're also, again, going to review those designated representatives that are detailed in the bylaws. And we're going to be looking both organizationally as well as categorically um, so that we can make certain that those named positions are still appropriate and adequate to meet our needs as we move forward. Um, some of the new positions that become identified later uh, may be us making greater use of the advisory member capacity. We currently have two advisory members, uh, Jen and uh, Lisa Marshall from GIBEP are both advisory committee members. We might be exploring that more fully. We also, item three, might be exploring some alternative structures for our committee positions that aren't appointed by board members, this might mean that we develop some caucuses around certain positions so that we can have people waiting in the wings to rotate in on a specific time frame to be determined. We're going to talk about it to make sure that they're primed and ready to jump into NRAC and provide meaningful input and content, but we're also setting them up for success. They know what's going on in the community. They understand what the expectation is with NRAC, and, and we're really having a conversation. We want these new voices to serve as a gateway um, to, to new audiences and to really reaching these sort of disparate communities that we haven't necessarily tapped into. Final item that we're going to be exploring as a part of the bylaws update, it's really, you know, perfunctory. We're going to clean up the bylaws. There's some old language in there. Uh, there's something in there right now that limits attendees to only coming via conference call twice per year. Well, this isn't a conference call, but certainly that's limited, especially in light of the pandemic. So we're going to do some housekeeping there. Again, our next meeting is June 8th, where we're going to talk about adopting that language to uh, outline our guiding principles. And we're also going to start looking at our designated representatives. If you're interested, send me an email or send Richard an email, and we'd love to have you. Any questions about the bylaws subcommittee? All right, thank you. Thank you, Kathy. Yeah, that's a that's an interesting uh, group. Uh, I'd like to see as many people as possible participating in that to to make sure that we're mapping out a, a good direction for where to take the NRIC in the future. So, if you're interested, please send me an email. All right, the next one is a topic of the day. Uh, with Stephanie Glenn with the uh, Houston Advanced Research Center, uh, Aaron Kinney with the Houston Advanced Research Center, and Amanda Hackney with uh, Black Cats GIS. And they're gonna talk about the partnership and litter abatement. Uh, please take it away. Okay, thank you very much. This is Stephanie Glenn. I wanted to say hi. Um, Aaron Kinney is actually gonna start us off. She's the first part um, where Aaron and Amanda and I are all giving um, different perspectives of a project that we've worked on together for a little while. So Aaron, you wanna take it away? Yeah, thank you, Kathy. I will share my screen now. Here we go. Well, thanks everybody. We're excited to have this opportunity to speak with you about the work we've been doing in litter abatement. Um, We've been working both regionally and lately statewide. So we're very excited to show off uh, some of the progress that we've made. Three of us are gonna be speaking today. I'm Erin Kinney. I'm a research scientist at HARC. I'll be getting us started talking about the beginning of the Galveston, um, uh, excuse me, the Lower Galveston Bay Watershed Aquatic Debris Action Plan, as well as Partners in Litter Prevention. I'll then be passing it off to Amanda Hackney from Black Cat GIS. She'll be talking about her field work and some of the methods that she's been developing. And then we'll be wrapping up with Dr. Stephanie Glenn, also from HARC. She'll be talking about our Texas Trash Litter Database. So I think most of us in this room are pretty well aware that Houston has a bit of a trash problem. Um, on average, the citizens of Houston produce about 6.2 pounds of solid waste per day. So if we combine that statistic with what we know about municipal waste in the United States, which is um, supposedly about 13% plastic, doing the math, then we're looking at the fact that each Houstonian 
each day, excuse me, Houston could produce um, over 5 million pounds of plastic or almost 2 billion pounds of plastic per year. That's a lot of plastic. Um, and we know that a lot of it is in our waterways, um, on our land, and it's causing problems. And there are a lot of people working on trying to solve that problem from coming from different directions. So those folks who are working in this, in this uh, realm of litter and trash abatement, prevention, education, research, we all started coming together and recognizing that we were working on a lot of the same questions, um, a lot of the same problems and with a lot of the same goals, but we weren't coordinating our efforts. So the action plan started to gain traction and we came together and we call ourselves partners in litter prevention. We are a non-regulatory stakeholder red group of about 25, actually now probably closer to 30, government agencies, departments, nonprofits, and private organizations. We started off with a trash summit in May of 2017 at the Houston Zoo. And we have had a trash summit every year since then. Our latest was yesterday. It was a big success. We had over 65 people attending from all over the state. And those trash summits have offered us the opportunity to talk about the work that we're doing, talk about our common goals and start to shape a regional action plan. And in addition to those trash summits, we had phone workshops to brainstorm goals, to um, edit uh, what we felt would represent an action plan for the Houston Galveston region. And that has come together as the Galveston Bay Watershed Trash Action Plan. All of us coming together really identified a need for more research and assessment. Uh, we knew there was a problem, but we didn't know how to put numbers on that. Um, and we also recognize the fact that we could get so much more done if we coordinated our efforts and really leveraged what other groups were already doing in order to push the problem and the solutions forward more quickly. We wanted to work much harder towards prevention and hopefully put ourselves out of the cleanup of business. We also recognize the need for removal and emergency response and preparedness especially after the flood events that have pushed so much debris down through the waterways into Galveston Bay. We started looking at action plans that exist uh, through the NOAA framework for different states. Uh, Florida has a particularly good one, um, Oregon, Hawaii, the Great Lakes. There are a bunch of examples out there and we started reading up on them and seeing what they had in common and how we could use that framework for to advance our work here in the Lower Galveston Bay watershed. And uh, we didn't think it would be like, it was likely that Texas would be writing one anytime soon. So we wanted to move forward with the group that we had because we already had so many things in common. So um, the document that we've come up with is the 2020 Galveston Bay Watershed Aquatic Debris Action Plan. And the, oh, I'm, I apologize, the URL has been cut off at the top, but you can go to donttrashagoodthing.org and uh, the latest version of that should be uploaded uh, sometime later this week. This document is not intended to be regulatory or specifically binding on actions or time frames, but what it does do is it addresses many of the aspects of marine debris and aquatic trash, like removal, prevention, awareness, education, outreach, and research needs that we're all grappling with to kind of give us a common language and a document that we can hold up and, and use in our efforts to gain funding, to gain traction for the work that we're doing and say, this is, we all agree on this. This is the group who is behind us and we need to move this forward because the problems have been identified and the solutions are outlined here. So as a group, we came up with three goals of the action plan. Those are research, um, reduction and removal. And under each of these, we've identified different strategies and actions that really are being fulfilled by different members of the Partners of Litter Prevention. So for instance, under the research goal, we have strategies that range from identifying resources and costs of effort, the data gap analysis, um, developing an understanding of life cycle, transport and quantity, monitoring and also metrics and metadata for that monitoring, as well as researching the effectiveness 
of the communications campaigns that are currently ongoing and communications campaigns in the future. For the reduction goal, our strategies range from increasing awareness and changing behavior of members of the public and the folks who live in the Lower Galveston Bay watershed to promoting and encouraging producer and merchant responsibility, as well as enhancing efforts to support waste reduction. And finally, in removal, we have essentially removal of everything from macroplastics down to microplastics, but also including removal of disaster debris because we recognize that for those episodic events, that is a really overwhelming task that needs to be addressed along with the more chronic litter and, and trash and even microplastic removal and research. So since last fall, uh, actually since fall 2019, we have been working to complete the action plan edits and done. It's ready to be posted, it's ready to be shared. And more importantly, um, it's ready to be put into action. So right now we are seeking letters of support. We are gonna be reaching, we've already reached out to our partners in litter prevention yesterday at the trash summit. And we're gonna be asking for them for specific statements of support of how the action plan supports the, their mission and their goals already. Um, really as examples of how broad reaching this document can be and how it can be a force of change we're hoping in this region. We're also gonna be reaching out to some of the larger entities, both state and federal and, and local agencies, um, asking if they will lend us letters of support stating how this supports their goals and their overall mission as well. And then finally, um, we have been working towards launching a litter database and that's actually beginning to be coming out in June. So Stephanie will be talking about that uh, at the end of this presentation, but first I'm gonna pass it off to Amanda who will give us a really interesting presentation of what she's been seeing on the ground over the last year. All right, thanks Erin for passing it over. So I'm gonna talk about some of the field work that um, we've done to try to get a, an idea of what kind of trash we have out there and to start to pull together, um, you know, some data sheets and good methodology to promote. Next slide, please, Erin. So we were funded by the Garver Black Hilliard Family Foundation, uh, Hark and my company, Black Cat. And our task was to do a methodology, methodology comparison between uh, these different techniques in our area. And we just wanted to gather a lot of data that would help inform this uh, Texas litter database. Some folks report things in number of bags, some folks report you know, total weight that was at a cleanup. So we wanted to start to, to figure out those um, relationships. Uh, an especially big goal was to come up with a rapid assessment um, methodology to gather information on plastics. Specifically, we were looking at plastic bottles. Next, Erin. So our rapid methodology method, we uh, developed into Take Two for Texas. It's field testing, um, go out, anybody, member of the public, and pick up as many plastic bottles as you can in two minutes. We tried to have people stand in one spot and count as many bottles as they could see in two minutes. And our bayous and beaches are really, really good at hiding trash. <laughs> so actually physically picking it up was a much better metric. And this is based on uh, Nurdle Patrol. If any of you have uh, seen that program, great program. They have folks pick up plastic nurdles for 10 minutes. So we went with two. And then again, we're gonna compare this data with our bag trash to get correlations between how many you can count and overall litter loads. That picture there is our record site. Uh, we picked up 47 bottles in two minutes, one person. Next slide. So for the longer stop surveys, and Stephanie's gonna to talk to you about the, um, the database where we're putting the information. The first thing we do is ask folks to go out and set up a transect. We want people to pick up all the trash between the high water line and the water itself. Theoretically, anything that could get back into the water and become active and moving again. Next slide. 
Uh, that last picture was beach related. This is a bayou. This is Bray's Bayou, right where it hits Buffalo Bayou. You can see kind of a totally different environment. Our beach isn't quite as wide, but we find a lot of fun stuff. Um, what we'll do, my interns and I, we've gone out, we'll pick up all the trash we can on a transect. We normally sort it, as you can see in that picture there from San Luis Pass. And then we will record every single item on these data sheets and tally them up. We try to pick up anything larger than a cigarette butt. Next. And Aaron, can you click on the video for that? So we would like people to do a 100 foot transect, but sometimes you just get overwhelmed with trash. So this is on White Oak Bayou, right across from Hollywood Cemetery. They're in the middle of town. This place was so bad, the three of us spent an hour and a half picking up 10 feet of transect. So if a place is just too trashy, we ask that folks reduce the amount and record their length. Next. Next, Aaron. And uh, I think this one's a video too, if you'll click on it. So again, we asked people to pick up every single piece of trash we see. We did have to make allowances for styrofoam and film as the fragments just get ridiculous. This particular spot was where we couldn't physically get down to the water because of erosion. It just wasn't safe. But it was, there was a very obvious flood line of trash and debris. So we were able to count from a safe if we could, to, could get to the edge to the high water line. Um, again, that high water line is our target. We want to go up to at least that. Um, and Stephanie will talk about how we estimate the fragments on the data sheet. Next. And here's some super fun data. So we started this in February, right before the pandemic. And we had these grand plans of doing monthly volunteer surveys and they were gonna be big cleanups and then COVID hit. So uh, we were shut down from March through May. I believe we started again in June. So what you're seeing here is our data that was collected in a little less than a year. And again, with COVID. So uh, most of our sites are in Harris and Galveston County. One of my interns is from Dallas, so he's done a few up towards that way. Um, that bottom table, which, sorry, it looks to be cut off a little bit. Um, these are 100 foot transects. Our record beverage bottles was 259 plastic bottles on the Texas City Dyke, right as you come in and they were all caught in that riprap. That is an outlier. However, you'll see Britton Park, which is right where Goose Creek hits the, the top of the bay there in Baytown, 137 bottles in 100 foot. So it's pretty bad folks. Um, that top pie graph shows you, we can condense things down into categories based on what the material is made of. About 40% of what we've picked up is hard plastic. The styrofoam and film numbers there, I know are underestimated because we just can't pick up every tiny little scrap of those two materials. Um, paper and PPE, we didn't, weren't finding any PPE on early studies, but then as we went forward, we are almost guaranteed to find a single PPE item, no matter where we are. Next. <laughs> so here is a table that shows you some of our more popular items. Um, we do have 63 different item categories. These follow the NOAA protocol very, very closely so we can compare our data with, for example, what GBF is doing in their NOAA surveys. We have a few additions of uniquely Texas things like plastic shotgun shells. NOAA didn't put that on the uh, you know, countrywide method. Um, on average, when I go to a site, and this is based on 73 surveys at 56 sites, we have visited some places more than once. On average, in 100 foot, I can expect to find about 16 plastic bottles, a little under 25 plastic containers or plastic caps, about 13 cigarette butts, five straws. And one thing that we've noticed a lot of is food and drink wrappers, chip bags, labels off of bottles, um, anything that's that kind of cellophane crinkly material, a big, big trash item for us. Next. 
And here's our broad type categories again. Um, again, in a 100-foot transect, I can expect to find, on average, 308 pieces of trash. Now, we have some very far outliers, like the Texas City Dyke. And then we have a few sites, well, not more, a few, several sites where we had hardly anything. For example, we sampled along the edge of a pond in Challenger Park, and we found like five cigarette butts, not much. So that number encompasses quite a variety of different types or different uh, survey site types. Um, again, hard plastic dominates. Styrofoam's right there and styrofoam and film are small again because we had to start estimating because there was just too much trash. Do note PPE total there, that includes um, disposable gloves and disposable or real masks. So we are almost guaranteed to find one PPE article for every 100 foot survey we do. Next. And with that, I will turn it over to Stephanie to talk about what we do with the data when we bring it back from the swamp. Great, thank you so much, Amanda and Erin. Uh, okay, so you've heard that we identified a need in the region for data collection and a database to store it in. Um, you've heard that Amanda has been super busy uh, testing out methods for data collection and how it actually works in the field versus you know, what might happen when you read about it and you think about it in a nice, neat and orderly manner. Um, and so then I'm gonna to talk to you about how we move that and how we are in the development of a Texas trash litter database that we plan to launch in June, which we're really excited about. Next, Erin. So um, as you've heard from them, our team on this, we've been funded by the Garber Black Hilliard Family Foundation. And the database itself was developed by HARP, but we worked in conjunction with Black Cat and um, Keep Texas Beautiful. And it's currently being tested by uh, Black Cat GIS and KTB, as well as um, other collaborators. Um, HJAC is one of them. Actually, we've been working with Kathy with her work with the NCT COG on their trash uh, grant. And um, people from Texas State University and the Meadows Foundation has also been testing it. So they've all been our brave beta testers on the database, which if you've ever done, you know, can be um, quite persnickety sometimes to be those first beta, beta testers. So we sure do appreciate that. The database itself will be housed at Keep Texas Beautiful once we get it developed, because the goal of the database is to have data for the entire state of Texas and for it to be completely transparent and open. So anyone that needs this, this trash data for a project, communications, outreach, uh, ledge session, whatever it is that you, you, know, you need to say, like Amanda said, hey, I went to this one place and I found 47 plastic bottles. We need to do something about this. Then the data are right there at your fingertips. Next, Erin. So what we're talking about here is everything from, as Amanda said, um, the kind of just the sacks of trash, that's one very common count that um, we have, or weights of trash. But the real goal of the database is to try to expand the data collection and get types so that we can see what are the real problem types in each area. Is it plastic bottles? Is it plastic bottle caps? Is it styrofoam? What is it that we really have to address? This can help prevention, this can help research, and it also helps outreach to know those types and amounts and locations where they're found. There's uh, also, we, you'll see in just a little bit, but we've got several different types of fields in the database, aside from just the types and amounts of trash. But in order to make it work for groups like Keep Texas Beautiful, um, HGAC, for example, for Trash Patch, there's certain things that they're required to keep track of, number of volunteers. Some groups actually have to report the age of volunteers. Um, if it's a, a road, a text dot road, that's important for Keep America Beautiful. So we have certain fields like that in the database as well as date, time, and place, and then location. Can you move to the next one? Um, and one more, I'm sorry, that's set up on it. Yeah, okay. So <clears throat> where we are right now, we began this project in fall of 2019. Uh, we started with this data collection and assessment that Amanda described. Um, Amanda was instrumental in helping us prepare kind of that, the meat, the interior of the database, if you will. Then we've working on the entry interface. So that's where you can enter in the data. This is either through the website, it's adaptable. So it can be on your mobile phone, it can be on your iPad, whatever it is you wanna take out in the field. 
And then there will also be an output side. So there you can just export the data. If that's all you want to do, you can grab the data. Um, there will also be a set of interactive charts and a map. So if you just want to be able to view the data, you can do that. Next, please. Uh, this shows the group that has been working together on this. And the entryway is that first page you see when you enter the database. And let's go one more. And you'll see that page close up. So when you first enter, you'll get the option to create a new event. So that's kind of the bigger umbrella. So for example, I'm gonna to go to Trash Bash again. If you are creating an event for Trash Bash, you can put in the date and the, the name of the event. And then underneath that event can be many different reports. So you can have many different locations, um, data entries under that one event if you want. And then you can also download the field sheet here. So again, actually let's go ahead and go to the next one. Okay, and so this shows that field sheet, the stop survey data sheet. So you can take that out into the field and you can see here, she's got it tucked underneath her arm um, and you can put the data down there. Um, so you can either pick it all up at once, separate it, tally it on your field sheet and then take it back to your computer and enter in the data there. But it is, the, the website itself is mobile, it's adaptive. And so that means you're gonna be able to see it on your phone or on your iPad just as easily as you could on the screen. Um, so then the, the field format for the iPad and the phone, um, most of that's through a toggle interface. So you'll just see as much as you want and you can go through and enter in that data. One more. This gives kind of a close up of that event. And what's really nice about this is when you enter in that data, if you are the field coordinator, you'll get an event ID, you'll get a URL and you'll get a QR code. You can share any of those with all your site coordinators so that they know what where to enter the data, kind of what that event is, and everyone's automatically coordinated. And then if you see the arrow at the bottom there, you'll be able to tell immediately how many related trash events are in with your event. One more. Okay, this is what I was talking about with the toggle buttons. Um, so for the detailed trash classification, if you actually did the full audit, then I believe there's eight different categories, hard solid plastic, um, film, plastic, styrofoam, there's several different categories. So depending on what you have, you might want to drop down all of those. Uh, Amanda was talking earlier about the fragments. Every category has an estimated fragments and you just choose. Um, at first, um, they were counting fragments and that takes a long time. This just kind of allows you to estimate the category. Um, and then people will be able to work with those categories later on. And then that arrow at the top right, you see right now it's going to dashboard. There's maps and charts. So that dashboard is really for for you, you'll be able to see all the data that you've entered, all the events you've, you've done, and then the maps and charts is where you can pull the data out of the database. One more. So this is just a little bit about expected outcomes. Amanda showed you all that data that she put in earlier. This was actually from um, some of the first initial efforts through the end of 2020, um, counts from 64 sites. But this was just a, a super quick grab I was able to do from the database. Um, and create a chart like this. And you can see here that the problem with these areas, this is round gallons a day. This was over, I think, uh, 5,000 maybe total counts. And of those over half were hard plastics. So this is, I mean, it's, it's really amazing. This is, this is one of the first efforts to get this kind of full count on data uh, in, in Texas really that we've had. And then to be able to have it accessible, to have the data accessible to everyone um, is gonna help a lot of campaigns, a lot of outreach and a lot of education. One more, I think that might be it. Yep, that's it, that's the website. Um, and Erin spoke a little bit earlier about our um, partners in litter prevention and Amanda worked on this new logo for us over, we are very proud of it. <laughs> so we're gonna take the opportunity to show it off now. And that is it, thank you, we appreciate the time. Thank you. That was uh, very informative, and I hope that everyone will participate and start using some of your tools. Thank you. All right. Uh, I guess it's time to do the roundtable discussion. Does anyone want to bring anything up? Well, I can hear those crickets chirping. <laughs> this is Kathy Jansen. 
I know Tom Douglas had shared some information via email prior to the start of this meeting. I don't know if he wanted to share that with the group or Tom, if you want us to just post it into the chat. Yeah, I'm trying to put it in the chat at the moment. I bet Andrea will do it for you since you sent it to her. If you want to just give us a, a, a quick overview. There it goes. Ah. Um, yeah, there, there's the um, comment that I made is that there's a um, uh, an annotated slideshow available online, um, and it's about explore nature on Houston area paddling trails. And we have five designated paddling trails from North to South Cypress Creek, Greens Bio, Buffalo Bio, Bray's Bio, and Clear Creek. Um, and uh, if you want to look at that, it's a slideshow, and there's comments attached to each slide. So uh, if you're in one of those five areas or you're interested in getting people out to explore nature and understand more about our local waterways, um, that's a place to start. Thanks. It's been a lot of information from HJC staff and then the great presentation we got from Hark and Black Cat, but this is your opportunity to speak. Does anybody have anything else they're working on or that they'd like to share with the group? It sounds like we're all worn down. Yeah. <laughs> I think the next one is uh, public discussions. Yes, we or have. Comment. Yes, we have one member of the public signed up to make public comment, and that is Jason. Hello, Jason. Hello. Uh, thank you uh, um, for allowing me to speak today. I just wanted to um, introduce myself and to also uh, tell you a little bit uh, about what's going on here at Jesse Jones Park and. Um, in some of our community-based science programs that we're looking to do here. Uh, I've been working closely with uh, Dr. Brian Schmefsky at Lone Star College Kingwood, as well as with Alicia Mine Johnson from the Citizens Environmental Coalition to increase uh, awareness of uh, all the, the, the different issues that are really you know, have been plaguing the Houston area uh, recently, uh, particularly the uh, extreme precipitation events we've been seeing, uh, you know, just you know, flooding and, and how we could mitigate that um, in, 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 in with a resiliency uh, strategy. And, and, and I think that uh, by getting different organizations involved, like the Master Naturalist, Native Plant Society, um, the... Uh, we have the Children's Environmental Literacy Foundation. These are just some of the organizations we're looking to get involved with uh, to have them come out to the park and assist us with either um, direct citizen science programs, or eventually we're even looking to get into doing some research out here with regards to phytoremediation and, uh, and erosion control, you know, using uh, you know, plants and, and other vegetation. So uh, I just uh, wanted to, uh, to, to let everybody know kind of what's going on. Uh, we're having a forum on floods and phytoremediation uh, August 7th. So if anybody is interested uh, in speaking or uh, helping out with that, uh, we, we would love to, to have some, uh, some, some expertise in, 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 in these areas. Uh, to sit on the panel and to not only give some presentations, but also to answer questions from the public and these different organizations. And, and then in, in kind of taking off that, we've, uh, we've received a small stipend from uh, NOAA and the um, Museum of Science in Boston uh, for the uh, Citizen Science, Civics and Resilient Communities Project. Uh, so we've got a, a little bit of money there to uh, put back into either uh, purchasing uh, trees and, and other plants or even you know utilizing that for uh, an honorarium for uh, people to come speak at our forum. So if anybody has any ideas or anything like that, uh, you can reach out to myself and uh, Dr. Schmefsky. Um, uh, you can uh, email me at jjp at hcp4.net. And uh, if you have any ideas or, or people you think might be great for our forum.
So uh, I want to thank Kathy uh, for, for uh, allowing me uh, to speak as well as uh, the NRAC. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm really looking forward to uh, getting more people involved in the park here. That's fantastic and very exciting, Jason. I will grab your contact information from your email and post it here into the chat in just a moment. And Perfect. we'll also include you in the meeting minutes. If anybody is interested in participating in that, that sounds like a great opportunity. Thank you and uh, y'all have a great day. Yeah, a question from Tom Douglas. So does phytoremediation focus on getting rid of plants we don't want or establishing plants we do or both? Very good question. So we have multiple uh, programs right now. One of them, it's called Invasives Beware, which solely revolves around removing uh, not only uh, invasive species, but some uh, native species that have kind of gone crazy like Yopon, Holly, and, and some other things uh, that would normally would be controlled by, by fire. So um, Th this it would be a portion of it, but that, that's kind of a, a separate aspect to our programs. Uh, this would revolve more around doing plantings uh, and, and then potentially utilizing the, those areas of plantings uh, for uh, to, to figure out, hey, what, what plants are, are better at, uh, you know, filtering out contaminants and, and things of that nature. So, um, so we're kind of utilizing both of those at the same time. Thanks. You're welcome. Okay, if there's no more questions, I'll... <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Jason. Thank you. All right, well, the next meeting, as has been said before, will be on Thursday, August 5th, uh, again, from 1.30 to 3.30. And uh, I hope we'll be meeting in person that, by then. We can hope. Uh, otherwise, we'll do another Zoom meeting. It's certainly possible, Do so I... I apologize. You know, go ahead. Uh, on the subject of in-person meetings, so HGC is currently exploring its strategy for back to work. We're anticipating a phased return um, as case numbers go down and vaccination numbers go up, but there isn't a hard date for when we will be back in office. Um, it's very possible in the future that we will have hybrid meetings, but at this time you should anticipate it being virtual unless you hear otherwise. And I did have one other brief announcement. I apologize, Richard, it's not on the agenda. I just wanted to say, I will see you guys in November. I will be going out on FMLA starting on June 1st. And Justin Bauer, who you all know, he presented today, he was the longstanding staff coordinator for NRAC, will be shepherding both the bylaws process and NRAC uh, through August. So I appreciate it. And I will see you guys in November. Oh, well, I'm not sure how we're going to get along without you, even with Justin's help. You're going to do just fine, but thank you for saying it. <laughs> All right. Uh, I'd like to like to adjourn. Uh, is, does anyone have a motion? I'll move to adjourn. Tom Douglas. Brian, and just a second. second. Thank you, Brian. Uh, I call this meeting to an end. Thank you very much.